happen. So thank you everyone for coming to our first program in celebration of Earth Day or Earth Month, you could call it. Um, my name is Maddie. I'm the Marketing and Outreach Manager for the Boyan Beach City Library, and we're excited to have you all here. So just a brief overview of how things are going to go. So we have Kira here tonight to give our presentation and Rebecca Harvey is going to give more of an introduction on her. But if at any time you have questions, you can drop them in the chat feature or in the Q&A feature. Make sure that if you are using the chat feature, you either send it to panelists and attendees, which means everyone will see it, or you can just send it to panelists and our speakers will see it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca and she can give an introduction on Kira. Great. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this special presentation on what the climate crisis means for Florida. My name is Rebecca Harvey. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the city of Boynton Beach. And in partnership with the Boynton Beach Library and Recreation and Parks Department, we are celebrating Earth Day throughout the month of April with a variety of events and activities. All of them can be found on one website, gogreenboynton.com. And I just wanna share a few quick highlights of our Earth Month activities with you. This Saturday, um, April 17th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we're having a drive-through Earth Day celebration and tree giveaway at the Ezel Hester Junior Community Center at 1901 North Seacrest Boulevard. 200 native and fruit trees will be distributed to city residents on a first come first serve basis. Residents can choose up to two of the following trees, soursop, Barbados cherry, avocado, slash pine, and Simpson stopper. All attendees will also be able to enjoy earth friendly giveaways, healthy food and music from our crowdsourced Earth Day playlist. Also throughout the month of April, all community members are invited to join Mayor Grant in taking the Wyland National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation. Help show other cities around the nation how Boynton Beach takes, takes care of our planet. Just visit mywaterpledge.com. It only takes a minute. You pledge your commitment to save energy and water and you're entered into prize drawings for um, home utility bills, um, uh, discounts on your home utility bills, home improvement store gift cards, and much more. So again, it's mywaterpledge.com. Go on there and sign up for Boynton Beach. And one last update is that throughout the month of April, you can also check out our dressed to a, dressed to a tea tree wrapping. 12 trees in uh, downtown Boynton Beach along Ocean Ave and then two at the Hester Center will be dressed up in sustainable recycled fabrics and spring colors. They're really beautiful. So get out there and take a picture, post it in social media with the hashtag GoGreenBoynton and you'll be entered to win um, in a drawing to win a $20 gift card from one of our Go Green restaurant participants. Uh, the program Dressed to a T provides an opportunity for adults with special needs to express their artistic talents while bringing awareness to nature and our beautiful trees. And again, all of this and much more can be found on the Earth Day page at gogreenboynton.com. And now I will turn it over to our main presenter. Her name is Kira Lichtenfeld. Kira is a high school student in Boynton Beach who is passionate about climate change mitigation and ocean conservation. Kira is a trained climate reality leader, a Clio Institute certified climate speaker and president of the Marine Conservation Club at her high school. So thank you all for joining us and I'll turn it over to Kira now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming. I just want to take a quick minute to thank Ms. Harvey and the Boynton Beach City Library for having me today. I'm just going to share my screen and then we will get started. All right, so um, today we're going to be talking about what the climate crisis means for Florida. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of climate change 
and um, some solutions and impacts specifically for Florida. So this is the first picture of Earth fully illuminated that any of us ever saw, and it's called the Blue Marble, and it was taken on the last Apollo mission, and it really changed the way that we think about our common home. It reminds us that we're all connected and that our actions have an impact on the planet. This image is from the space station, and it shows what's probably one of the most important facts about the climate crisis. Um, and the nature of the sky, which is when we look up at the sky, it seems like a limitless space, but in reality, um, it's actually a very thin shell of the atmosphere surrounding the planet, and we're very capable of changing its chemical composition, which we're in the process of doing so with climate change. So here's the basic science of global warming, and it's been understood by scientists since the 1800s. So energy from the sun uh, comes to the earth in the form of light. That energy is then absorbed by the earth and warms it. Some of that energy is re-radiated back into space. While some of that outgoing heat is trapped by our atmosphere, which is actually a good thing because it's one of the things that allows for life on Earth by keeping um, the Earth at a stable temperature. But unfortunately, what we're doing now is um, thickening this natural greenhouse gas layer. So it's trapping more of that heat. And this is global warming, and that's the basic science of it. And that's what is causing the climate crisis and leads to all of the other impacts that we're gonna talk about. So the problem is that we're changing the thickness of that band of heat trapping gases that we just talked about. And right now we're spewing about 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every day. And this pollution comes from a variety of sources um, from a variety of different human activities such as transportation, agriculture, and industrial processes. So the biggest source of this uh, greenhouse gas pollution is the burning of fossil fuels. And if you look at this image and you see after World War II, you can see just how rapidly um, our emissions have gone up. So each molecule of carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas, stays in the atmosphere for about um, 100 years, and it traps all of the heat for that time. And this is definitely one of the single largest causes that we have to focus on. So one of the main impacts um, is obviously, since more heat is being trapped in our atmosphere, the global surface temperatures are rising. So here in this graph, you can see the year by year temperature record and you can see just how quickly the temperatures are increasing and um, how in the last couple of years we've experienced um, record temperatures. In fact, 19 of the hottest years ever measured um, have been in the last 20 years and um, um, five of the hottest have been in the last five years. So although we're focusing on Florida in this presentation, it's still important to uh, talk about how climate change affects other parts of the world. So in the last two to three years, we've seen incredible temperatures such as um, in this area of India, 123 degrees Fahrenheit. Australia recently set a new time, um, an all time high temperature record with 111 degrees Fahrenheit. In Japan, they tied their all time temperature record with 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And a little closer to home here in the United States, Miami, Florida, just last summer recorded its hottest week ever in late June. And this will cause a lot of health impacts and make it harder for agricultural workers and doing activities outside. So not only is it just obviously more uncomfortable to be in hotter weather, 
but it can also have severe impacts on the populations that live there. And both Miami and Phoenix have experienced the hottest months ever um, in July of 2020. So you can see just how, how much these um, major heat events are increasing because of climate change. So now we're gonna look a little bit at the oceans. Um, a lot of the extra heat, actually 93% that we are um, trapping in our atmosphere goes into the oceans. And um, this contributes to a lot of different issues, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, but basically the ocean absorbs the majority of the extra heat that we're putting out into the atmosphere. So obviously one of the main impacts of this, um, since there's more heat going into the, excuse me, going into the oceans, that the ocean temperature will rise. So you can see from this graph that ocean temperatures have reached their all-time high record level last year, and they've been rapidly increasing. Um, and just like global surface temperatures, the ocean temperatures are increasing tremendously as well. All right, so here in Florida, we are very familiar with hurricanes and climate change actually impacts hurricanes um, a lot. So warmer oceans can lead to more intense hurricanes, so they are stronger. They also intensify much more rapidly. So not only are they stronger hurricanes, but they become stronger more quickly. Warmer air also ho holds more moisture. So since we're increasing the temperature um, of the earth, it holds more moisture, which leads to heavier downpours. So that will make the hurricanes wetter as well. So when, they, when we do have hurricanes, um, they will have stronger downpours, which will obviously lead to more flooding and more destruction. Storm surge will also increase just because the general level of the sea is so much um, greater due to sea level rise. Um, so again, that will lead to flooding and destruction. And lastly, a wavier jet stream, which is caused by climate change, um, will hold storms in place longer. And we've seen this with Hurricane Dorian, which we'll look at in a few slides. Um, but basically, the climate crisis impacts hurricanes a lot. So especially for our area in South Florida, where we're very familiar with hurricanes, we need to make sure that we are educated um, about how it impacts our hurricanes and make sure that we're working towards mitigating climate change so that um, these effects won't become much worse. Our next hurricane season is predicted to be a particularly bad one with, I think, um, if I remember correctly, 17 named storms, which is tropical storms and hurricanes. So definitely make sure that you're prepared for this hurricane season. So here's just a few examples of these major storms. Um, for example, this typhoon in the Philippines um, affected over half a million people. A little closer to home in Mexico Beach, um, they were hit by Hurricane Michael, which was later reclassified as a category five, which I'm sure you all know is the strongest. Um, and it just devastated the communities where it landed. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this type of footage from Hurricane Dorian um, when it was stalled over the Bahamas for 40 hours, dropping five feet of rain. So um, you can just see from this footage that it absolutely devastated those areas. So another basic fact that we need to keep in mind is that warmer air can hold more water vapor. And for every one degree Celsius increase in the air temperature, that air can hold another 7% of water vapor. So as our air is becoming warmer because of global warming, it will hold more water. And the increase has already reached 5%. And this leads to major rain events. Um, this is called a rain bomb. It's just a massive downpour of water. So since the air can hold more water, when it releases the water um, and when it rains, it will just release a massive amount um, of water. And here's just another example of those rain bombs. 
and this will obviously lead to flooding. Um, so for example, in Japan, you can see this one area is just completely flooded um, from the rain that they experienced. Another example in Japan, you can just see how absolutely devastating um, this flooding can be. So here we see is one of the most productive areas of Iowa in 2018 and then in 2019. So you can see how these major rain events um, can take an area that was once incredibly productive and just wipe it out. Another example from England, New Jersey, Washington, DC, New Orleans, Tennessee. And just for reference, um, you can see just how high the water level is. Those are like the tops of houses that you're seeing. So, so the water is at least one story high. So these um, precipitation events are increasing in frequency and you can see um, just how much they've been increasing um, on this graph and the damage that they've been doing is also increasing. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit, still on the theme of water, but we're gonna talk a little bit about ice. Um, so this is the floating ice of the Arctic around the North Pole and you can also see Greenland there. So one of the main um, important things about ice is that it reflects heat. It reflects about 90% of the sun's rays. And as the ice melts, it reveals the dark surface of the ocean, which absorbs um, more of that heat. So that's why the temperatures are increasing so much more rapidly in the Arctic. So light surfaces um, such as ice reflect heat, but as it melts and it reveals the dark ocean underneath, it begins to absorb a lot more of that heat. And you can see just in the last 1500 years um, how it's, pretty, it's been pretty steady until very recently. Um, the Arctic ice loss has dropped um, dramatically. So we're losing a lot more ice um, in just the recent couple of years than we have in the last 1500. So for example, in Greenland, um, the ice is melting four times faster than they originally thought. Um, and this is definitely a deep cause for concern. If we switch to look at the Antarctic, um, you can see how that ice loss has also increased in recent years compared to um, how it was measured previously. And the South Pole is melting, um, is warming three times faster than the Earth as a whole. And this is happening with both poles. Um, so you may be thinking, you know, what does ice melt in the poles have to do with me? It's far away. Um, we're not affected by it. But in fact, it is along with thermal expansion, it is one of the um, biggest causes of sea level rise. So obviously this affects us a lot living on a, a low lying coastal area. So if you take a look at this graphic, it shows the top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise by population. And you can see that Miami is up there um, with number nine. But if we shift and take a look at um, the cities at risk by assets, you can see Miami is number one on that list and um, New York pretty close behind. Um, so you can just see how much this is gonna affect our areas, um, considering that we're very close to Miami and we're in a similar area. And you can see some effects of this here. This is actually from Boynton Beach, um, from after Hurricane Dorian and when there were king tides and sea level rise contributed, all of these things contributed to the flooding that you see in this image. And sea level rise is the reason why you see this octopus in a parking garage in Miami. Um, and we're seeing dramatic increases in the level of the tides because the sea um, itself is just increasing so much. 
And this is one from a flood in Washington, D.C. And you can see there's actually a guy um, fly fishing on the National Mall. And he actually caught a fish. So one of the other main issues associated with climate change in the oceans is coral bleaching. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this in the Great Barrier Reef. So basically what happens is coral has a symbiotic relationship with algae called zooxanthellae. And when the um, oceans warm too much, the coral expels the algae and they begin to die. So like I mentioned, this is happening in the Great Barrier Reef, which has actually lost half of its coral cover in just the last 30 years. And um, this is also a big issue here. We have a lot of reef systems in Florida, especially um, near the Keys. So this obviously impacts the ecosystems that live around the coral and the coral ecosystem, but it can also impact us and our tourism industry um, because a lot of, because reef systems attract a lot of tourism. So another issue associated with oceans and climate change is ocean acidification. So with the carbon dioxide that we are emitting, um, it creates more acidic oceans, and they're actually 30% more acidic um, since the Industrial Revolution. Populations of marine vertebrates are also impacted by climate change, and they've actually decreased about 50% since 1970. Um, a lot of these marine vertebrates are at the top of the food chain, and if their populations begin to decline or they become extinct altogether, it can have major implications for the rest of their ecosystem. And if we take a look at fish, um, we've seen warnings from scientists that if we allow the temperature to continue and we continue um, to pollute the environment, that there will be a 40 to 60% um, decline in fish species. So 40 to 60% will be at risk by the end of the century because the waters are too warm to support them. And this is a big issue because more than a billion people rely on fish as their primary source of protein. And a lot of people just eat fish in general, so it's an important food source, but it will also devastate our fishing industries. So here in Florida, um, we will be impacted by the climate crisis through our tourism. So extreme heat and humidity, um, which we talked about a little bit from, from just the general um, increase in heat of the planet, um, will dissuade people from coming um, and visiting Florida. There's also expected to be an increase in vector-borne diseases. Uh, extreme weather events are expected to continue, um, like we mentioned, the hurricanes. Beach erosion and coral bleaching are other two issues that will affect our tourism. So the Union of Concerned Scientists actually predicts that by 2100, our tourism industry could lose about $178 billion annually. So we definitely, as Floridians, need to be educated about the climate crisis and work towards solutions um, for our own benefit for saving the planet and also for our economy. And you can also see um, there's been devaluation of Florida real estate because of tidal flooding and about $6 billion have already been lost. And you can see the projections are for a lot more. And for a nearby area for uh, New York, they're also at a high risk from flooding. So there's about $129 billion worth of real estate in that area that's now vulnerable to flooding. So here's just a list of some more of the impacts of climate change. Um, we talked about a couple of these, but here's a more extensive list. And it's, it's said to be the number one threat to the global economy. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit um, to the more optimistic part, the solutions. So there are three main types of solutions, um, action through individuals, which honestly has the least impact, but in, in large individual action, in large groups, um, it can have a much bigger impact. But the main two are companies and municipalities and federal action. So we really need change through, through policies and through um, companies changing their, 
their um, business procedures to create real change. So there are two main ways of mitigating climate change. Um, one is stopping carbon emissions at the source and the other is sequestering carbon. So the first one is cutting off um, our emissions of greenhouse gases at the source. Um, for example, fossil fuels release a lot of greenhouse gases. So, so stopping that um, emission at the source and sequestering carbon is basically taking carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, so that one is a little bit more reactive, but together um, these solutions are very promising. So one of the top solutions is renewable energy, and we need a mix of doing it at the utility level and the individual level. Um, so for some examples, we have wind energy, solar farms, and rooftop solar, and only about three to four of our electricity in Florida comes from renewable energy. So people are generally very supportive of renewable energy, um, and it's bipartisan, which you can see um, in the studies shown on the screen. And so just for an example, in California, they mandated that all new homes have been pretty welcoming to that. And here you see a list of states that have committed to missing from this list. It starts with an F. Yes, it's Florida. So even though we have not made a commitment, many other states made commitments to 100% renewable energy. Um, you can see just some examples. New of some uh, cities around the world that have already committed to 100% renewable. So here's a list of utilities that have committed to 100% renewable. You'll notice FPL is not on there, unfortunately, but um, these are some of the utilities around the country that have committed. So in the global economy, over 240 multinational companies have um, made the pledge to go to 100% renewable energy. And you can see a lot of them on this image and a lot of the companies are providing tremendous leadership and moving faster than the countries where they're located. So even if the country that a company is located in is not making um, fast enough changes to their policies, the companies themselves can also um, make a big impact by changing to renewable energy. And on the job side, solar installers forecasted to be the fastest growing job category in the U.S. and area are at least 17 in Florida, um, how this is affecting us. Oh, Sorry, guys, I think there's some network issues. I wonder if Kira turns off her video, if that might help. Yeah. Kira, are you, is, are you able to figure out, troubleshoot what might be happening? Sorry, guys. Try and figure this out. Hold, bear, bear with us one moment. Technology isn't without its struggles. <laughs> Wait and see. Oh, looks like Kira's left, so maybe she'll re rejoin and then we will figure it out. One second. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're good. Cool. Are you able to share your screen or do you need me to give you? Okay, cool. 
Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. Back in business. <laughs> okay. Let me just. Did we lose our interpreter as well? Nope. Okay. Let okay. Me... Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, I think this is where we left off. So we were just talking about some of the impressive actions in South Florida. So Advantage Communications is a small business that has committed to 100% renewable energy through the climate reality um, chapter nearby, and they've installed rooftop solar in their office. Um, and another company, City Furniture, has agreed to go carbon neutral by 2040, and they're working towards that with a lot of initiatives like solar, um, getting LEED certified showrooms, and using energy efficient appliances. And we also see here in the city of Boynton Beach, they're striving for a 50% reduction of carbon emissions by 2035. Um, and net zero by 2050. And they're working on a lot of other great projects like the tree canopy project, which will help to reduce the impacts of heat, especially in lower income areas that are disproportionately affected by climate change. So these are just some examples of local leaders that um, are doing a lot with renewable energy. So next we have transportation. So transportation contributes a lot to our individual carbon footprint. And um, you can lessen your transportation footprint by using electric vehicles. Um, you can do hybrid vehicles if for some reason electric vehicles don't work for you. And airplane travel is difficult to decarbonize, but people are working on solutions. And the life of a vehicle is about five, excuse me, eight to 15 years. So it's important to think about your purchase since it has such a long um, life. So your purchase can contribute a lot to, to emitting greenhouse gases. And electric vehicles were actually around about 100 years ago. So here's one of the first EVs charging at a home in the early 1900s, which I think is a pretty cool picture. And Henry Ford and Thomas Edison were actually friends. And these are real quotes from them in the early 1900s. And they really thought that electric vehicles would be the way to go. Ford invested a million dollars in an EV project and was going to buy um, a lot of batteries from Thomas Edison. But oil was struck and there was money to be made. So the vehicles headed in that direction. And we see here um, that individual action on a large scale can have a massive positive or negative impact. So here we see that the popularity of SUVs has increased tremendously in the past couple of years, and they contribute a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, so if we switch more to electric vehicles, it can have a, a massive positive impact. And so for electric vehicles, um, there, a lot of people think that they're just very expensive and unrealistic. And while there are a lot of them that are expensive, there are more um, affordable electric vehicles now, such as from Kia and Chevy. And they also have a low cost of maintenance, which is important to keep in mind. At the municipality and company level, um, they can change to having an electric feet, fleet of buses, company vehicles, and public transportation. So for example, West Palm Beach obtained five electric school buses recently. All right, so talking a little bit about the sequestration part of the solutions. Um, so keeping forests intact are the best solution, but afforestation, which is planting trees, is also beneficial and protecting the forests are important not only for the ecosystems that live there, but also for carbon sequestration. And we can implement this solution in urban areas by increasing rooftop gardens, um, which also help to minimize the effects of urban heat islands. All right, so just to talk about deforestation a little bit, I'm sure many of you have heard about the fires in the Amazon rainforest. And um, cattle ranching accounts for most of that deforested land. And we're gonna talk about food um, a little bit later in the presentation, but just to keep in mind that deforestation is occurring and we need to make sure that we're protecting our forests. 
And this is a quote from Al Gore, just basically explaining that um, taking carbon dioxide out of the air, the best way to do that is with trees. Um, so basically we need to protect our forest and plant more trees um, to sequester carbon. All right, so for food, um, we're gonna talk about reducing food waste. So 30 to 40% of the entire US food supply is thrown away annually. And when food waste goes into landfills, it releases methane, which is a, another greenhouse gas, but it's actually about 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide, which means that it can hold 30 times more heat. So instead of putting your food waste in a landfill um, where it releases methane, instead you can compost it. I know some municipalities, um, such as in the Bay Area of California, they have um, composting in their cities, but unfortunately we don't have that here, um, but you can compost on your own um, and get a, a composting bin and do it yourself. Um, uh, cattle ranching, like we talked about, is one of the biggest causes of deforestation. So switching to a plant-based diet is beneficial for the environment and your health. I'm not saying you have to go fully vegan. I know it's hard. I am not fully vegan myself, but I definitely try to eat less meat and dairy and incorporate more um, plant protein into my diet. So if you can just work towards incorporating more plant protein and eating less meat and dairy, um, it can definitely have a big impact on the environment. And regenerative agriculture is basically more sustainable farming practices to ensure that the soil health is good and that um, we can have carbon sequestration through the soil. So some of these sustainable farming practices are no-till farming and crop rotation, which basically ensure the um, health of the soil and make sure that they're not being depleted of nutrients. Um, some companies are working towards regenerative agriculture. So for example, General Mills set a goal to have 100, excuse me, 1 million acres um, in its supply chain transition to regenerative agriculture by 2030. And a group of companies, including Ben & Jerry's, have been working on a certification for farmed goods with regenerative practices. And although companies and governments are working towards implementing these solutions, they're not being implemented fast enough. And this is what Rob Jackson is saying in this quote. And we really need to have systemic change through businesses and policies to solve the climate crisis. So the last thing I'm gonna share with you is a question that a lot of people have had recently, and that's have our carbon emissions gone down during COVID? And the answer is that they did for a little while, but they bounced back up and are expected to continue to rise. Basically, we just stopped for a little while um, and it was not sustainable and we really need systemic change to solve the climate crisis. All right, so that is what I have for my presentation. Um, and I think we're gonna take some questions now. Awesome. So yes, if anyone has any questions for Kira, you can either put them in the chat or use the Q&A feature and we will be sure to answer them. Um, let me spotlight. So just waiting a bit to see if anyone has any questions. I can start with one just to get the ball rolling. So um, Kira, what is one, I mean, you're, you're, you're in high school, so what is one easy way people your age can get involved in helping with the climate? Yeah, so I would say, well, one of the biggest personal changes that you can make um, is what we talked about with the food, with eating a plant-based diet, um, but to get involved in like organizations um, that are involved in this you can join um, the climate reality chapter of Boca Raton, which is um, a local group. And there's other groups such as the Sierra Club or the League of Women Voters. Um, you can also see if there's a club at your high school um, that is involved in environmental science and get some more resources from them. Or if there's uh, maybe an environmental science teacher, you can probably get a lot of great information um, from them. Awesome, thank you. And then we actually just got a question. What inspired your climate journey? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so 
I grew up going to California in the summers and that's where I really um, experienced like rich forests and um, began hiking. And that's really where I think my, my passion for this grew because I felt like we had to protect those areas. And um, I've been really lucky to be able to travel to some um, different areas around the country and see some really amazing natural beauties. Um, so I think a lot of my passion for this comes from seeing the natural areas um, around us and really wanting to protect those. Awesome. And then another question we got, what was the most eye-opening thing you learned about climate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the most eye-opening thing. I think I would go back to the the food because I I growing up I never really knew that like like red meat and and meat in general was bad for the environment um so I think that's one of the big things I learned also I would say um plastic which we didn't talk about here is actually produced from fossil fuels and um that contributes a lot to the climate crisis so I would say um, from the food aspect and plastics are are some of the, the two big things that I didn't know about um, that I was exposed to through this. Awesome. So I don't see any other questions. Oh, just got another one. Two, actually. Uh, Ellen asks, what areas of our homes will the trees be planted? Who does the actual planting? I don't know if that's a question for you or a question for Rebecca, possibly. I think it's Rebecca, Hi. maybe. Yeah, is that um, Ellen? Are you are you asking about the city of Boynton Beach, our tree canopy project? I assume that's what that's about. Um, so we are not currently um, planting trees at homes. Um, we are in the process of getting a contract to do ongoing plantings at parks and in other city owned properties um, throughout the city. So stay tuned within the next few weeks or month, we will have um, more park plantings coming up. Right now, what we do have are tree giveaways is like the one I said this Saturday at Hester Center at 10 a.m. I believe that answers the question, Ellen. Let us know if it doesn't. Um... But yeah, definitely go check out the tree giveaway. That'll be a lot of fun. And then question for Kira, which climate solution excites you the most? Um, I think I would say renewable energy. Um, you know, it's one of the, the main ways that we can limit um, our greenhouse gas emissions. And it, it's um, also beneficial for the economy. It's providing a lot of jobs. Um, it's definitely a difficult switch to make, but I think it's one of the most promising considering that, um, like we mentioned, it stops the carbon emissions at the source. Perfect. Awesome. Don't see any other questions in the chat. We'll give it a little bit. Oh, here we go. Right as I say that, more pop in. How do you think we can increase climate knowledge in our communities, especially among students? Yeah, so um, I was trained through the Clio Institute and the Climate Reality Project, um, which are two great organizations. The Climate Reality Project is actually doing a training um, starting around Earth Day. I think the registration is closed, but um, they will have future ones coming up. So you can be trained yourself, um, which is a great training that I went through. You can check them out at climatereality.org. Um, and doing presentations to your community like this one is a great way to get your community involved. Um, and if you become certified or if you're passionate about this issue and you know a lot and you're willing to do a presentation, you can see if a local high school is interested. Um, I think for high school students, like environmental science teachers offer a lot um, for education in this. And if that's not offered at a school or, or if a lot of students aren't taking it, I think um, doing presentations like these um, to schools are, are very beneficial. Definitely. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Those are, that's some great advice for someone who wants to get involved with helping out. 
Uh, I'm gonna say there's no questions, but one might pop up in a few mi- in a few seconds. So I'll give people some time if anything sparks their attention. Kira, what would you um, list as a top priority for city governments to, to take on right now? For city governments, I think. I think still the the goal of renewable really switching to renewable energy since that's like we talked about um, one of the most promising solutions. So I think it's great that Boynton Beach has committed to doing that. And, and we do have multiple EV chargers in the city too, which I think is pretty cool. I actually drive an electric vehicle, so I very much appreciate. <laughs> and we're getting very much appreciate over. that installing some more this year awesome awesome i know two four of them are located at city hall is that all of them right yeah, now or no, there are there um we have two dual chargers at city hall um those are through fpl's program and they're free to users you might if you see someone swiping their phone it's not they're not paying with a credit card they are just um, you have to swipe your charge point account if you ever try them anyone and have issues give me a call or contact me because you just have to go through a couple steps to sign up for fpl's program it's not hard and it tells you on the screen how to text to get the link to do it we also have some offline chargers that don't have any fancy um, login or anything and they're also free we have one at oceanfront park and at um, fire station five and at sarah sims park and we're working on installing some more. Awesome, thanks for telling us that. Uh, Adriana asks, how do you respond to people who believe climate change is a myth? So that is a great question. And honestly, um, a very difficult thing to figure out. Um, climate deniers are, are a very small percentage of the population. And I think it's just since they, they've they been pretty loud recently that is why we think that there's so many more of them. Um, honestly, it's very hard to change someone's mind about any issue. So this is the same. Um, but I think if if there's like uh, one specific thing you want to appeal to, for example, if you're trying to talk to um, people at a church or something like that, trying to appeal to their um, certain, certain sense of that, um, so I definitely think it's difficult to change people's minds and it's it's not always gonna work. It probably most of the time won't, um, but you can just try to appeal to, to certain aspects um, that you know that they are interested in. Great. Trying to see if we have any other questions. I don't see any on the Facebook live stream. So that's a no for that one. Give it a few more seconds if anybody has any questions. Kira, did you have any closing remarks or Rebecca that you wanted to mention before we cut it off? Maybe while people are typing. If not, no problem. Just figure I'd give you a chance to say something. Yeah, just thank you all so much for coming and to the Boynton Beach City Library again for having me. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's such so an honor. Here. Yeah. Yeah. It's so awesome, Kira, good. to see like good. people your age getting so involved with this. Thank you. So it, it's honestly so. J- Jillian says, "Fantastic presentation." Thank you. <laughs> Love that. It was great, very inspiring, Kira. And definitely. So good to have you and see the leadership coming from your your age group. We need you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so great. Um, so I don't see any other questions. So I guess with that, we're done. So thank you again, Kira. And thank you to Rebecca and the city for working with us to help and find you, Kira, to have you do this program for us. And remember to check out our other Earth Day events. The address, it's gogreenboyton.org.com. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. So yeah, yeah, definitely go there, check those out. Um, We have two more virtual events coming up. One is about exploring your own backyard and, you know, recognizing nature in your own backyard. And that's with 
Florida Master Naturalist program. And then the other one is a virtual lionfish dissection. Um, lionfish are an invasive species, so we're going to talk about that and see what one actually looks like. And so with that, I hope everyone has a good night, and hopefully we'll see you at the next program. All right, bye. Thank you.